Hi guys, my name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode 21 of my wildlife photography Q&A video series. It's been a rough couple of weeks, we've been all over the place. For those of you that I met in Cape Town at the Wild Shot Symposium, awesome, thanks for coming out, great fun. Doing it again in November, for those of you in Johannesburg that are key. One day filled with loads of wildlife photography inspiration, great talks, great speakers, 21st of November, Johannesburg, I will see you there. Other than that, um, I'm actually in Johannesburg for, for most of November, which is quite strange. So my dogs at home quite enjoy that. So, um, so, 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 lots to get done, lots of content coming your way. Picking up on these videos to see how far we can get without travel, it's a bit easier. So let's get right into it. Episode 21 starts now. Raw Wild, this is probably one of the most common questions that come up is the one not just specifically with teleconverters, but around the gear side of things. Teleconverters are great if, and it's a big if, you shoot with quality glass. If you shoot 300 2.8, 400 2.8, 500 f4, 600 f4, a teleconverter can work on it. I would even go as far as to say the 200, 400 f4 uh, can take it pretty well. The thing is, most of us and most amateur photographers shoot with lenses such as your 70 to 300, your 80 to 400, 100 to 400 if you're a Canon. Um, to go and add a teleconverter onto that, you need to know what the teleconverter is going to do. If your widest open aperture on the lens, for example, is 5.6, you slap a teleconverter on there, it's going to drop that aperture, allowing less light in, making it more difficult to shoot during the golden hours when there's beautiful things happening in the bush, but there's not much light coming in, which means you're gonna to have to punch your ISO up. Is it worth buying a teleconverter? Personally, if you're using those kind of lenses, I wouldn't even go there. I would rather worry about pulling back, getting a wider shot, even if it's at 400. You, don't, you can't get to 600. Rather shoot at 400, compose better, and use the environment in your shots to make it happen. Alternatively, use bushcraft and proper ethical behavior to get closer to those animals and then use your lenses from there. Eventually down the line you'll have the money, you'll save and you'll get that 500 f4 or one of those big guns that we also like. Alternatively, I mean realistically, if you're going on a big big trip, rent the lens. Speak to me, let's rent a lens for that time and you can get the best of both worlds. So teleconverters on the normal smaller lenses, 70, 300, 80 to 400, I'd be very hesitant to go there. If you have proper glass to put it on, absolutely, because remember, 2.8, even if it adds a stop of light onto it, I'm going to be shooting f4. Or if I'm shooting an f4, it becomes a 5.6. But when you do a 5.6 or a 6.3, you're going to start ending at a 7.1 or an 8. So teleconverter on those, what do we call them? Entry-level zoom lenses, I'd stay away from personally. Robert, this is a question that picks up from a discussion I had with a group on a workshop not more than, I don't know, I think two weeks ago, is the flashing of animals at night. Now, there's a couple of things here. Number one, what is the animal? For example, you should not be putting a spotlight or a flash on something like a wild dog or a cheetah at night because their eye structure doesn't allow for it to be filtered out. Yeah? Most nocturnal animals have something called a tapetum lucidum, which is a reflective layer of cells at the back of the eye, which not only helps them see better at night because of the way it reflects light forward and back, but it also protects the nerve endings, which comes into a small area called the fovea. How's that? Fovea is where the nerve endings come into the eyeball, and that's what the tapetum lucidum protects. Slightly down the rabbit hole, carrying on. So if you go and randomly just flash any animal, you are probably going to blur some ethical lines. If it's a nocturnal animal and it's done correctly by not influencing the animal's behavior, i.e. cubs, never, because they're younger, they still need to get used to living in game reserves, growing up like that, having spotlights, cars drives past, and flashes, perhaps. If it's animals on a kill, no, because, not on a kill, on a hunt, no, because why? You might then, for that second, like you say, blind the prey species, which makes it easier for the predator to catch that, that thing. I've never been a big fan of flash photography, not necessarily because I think it's wrong as such, but with groups and private clients, it's very difficult to manage one, two, up to six different flashes going off at one time. So, let's come back to the question, Jerry's rambling a bit, is 
I don't think there's an ethical problem if you approach it on a per case scenario. Ask your guide that you're with. If you're with us on a trip, ask your photo guide and say, listen, is it possible? If you do it and you still maintain the safety and the, the health, if you will, of your subject, I've got no problem with it. But, and this is something that happened at this workshop I mentioned, is there was a guy at the lodge flashing the shit out of a rhino at a waterhole. This guy kept going on and on and on. And there I've got a problem. There I have a problem because, I mean, think of it, you having a drink, some guy comes and flashes you with a big flash again and again and again, you're going to get pissed off as well. So it's just common sense. I mean, if we just use common sense and keep the safety and health of our subject in mind, I don't think it's a problem. But again, check with your guide, look at what species it is, and then, yeah, she'll be fine. Look, you can create some amazing images like that, but always, always, like you mentioned, stay on the ethical side of it. And if you're not sure, if you think it's a problem, rather don't do it. Kylie, this is a fantastic question because it's something we do on every single trip. More, pe more and more people are going the route of, of backpacking focus on the cameras. And I'm glad you asked the question because not many people think about the metering side of it. So let's all get on the same page. Focus is you telling the camera which part of the scene to make sharp and in focus, yes? That we do by using the back button. If you haven't checked it, go and check out the Wildlife blog. There's three or four very good articles on back button focus. The second part before you take an image is to meter, is to tell the camera which part of the scene to use to expose for. Should it look at the dark areas, the light areas? Mm -hmm. The easiest way kindly to do this is, if you look at your camera, you're gonna set up your focus on the back button like you have. You then set up on your shutter button, you set up metering, right? So how this would work, I would focus on my subject, back button, lock focus, that's locked, yeah? I can then move around in the scene, choose the area I wanna expose for, half to press the front button, which is my metering, recompose because I still have my focus locked, and then fire. Does that make sense? So it's almost like a two steps before you shoot. One, set up back button focus, hold that focus in. So compose, hold focus. You can now recompose, meter, yes, read the light in a certain area you wanna compose for, half to press the front buttons. Now you're holding two buttons in, recompose again and then shoot. Does that make sense? Once you understand the, 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 the workings of the camera and back button focus holds fo the focus while you keep the thumb down. Metering, if you've set it up correctly on your camera, half to press the front button, now you're holding both buttons while you recompose again, yeah, subject still in the frame. You've now told the camera with the front button, metering, where to meter and how to expose. You still have the back button, the thumb locked down for focus, and then shoot. It's much easier practically. Kylie, I'm not sure where you're from. This one came in on the website. Um, if you can pop into the office, that'd be great. Uh, alternatively, this is something we are looking at for future, as in courses and stuff online. Watch this space. But for now, short version again. Set up your camera, back button focus on the thumb, metering lock on the shutter button, and then once you've, once you've set both, then you fire the frame. You'll be in focus and you'll be metered properly for the exposure that you want. Daniel, the, uh, very well-timed question. I did pull this off email from a, a couple of weeks ago. I was still traveling, so apologies for only getting to your question now. Yesterday, again, I posted a little video clip on my Instagram feed saying to people, you need to think before you crop. I find it quite strange how people obsess so much about gear, but very few people think of the creative or the narrative within their stories, and cropping does this for you. Now, some of you that commented on that Instagram feed said, yeah, but you have to do everything in camera, it's wrong to crop, bullshit. You have to crop after the fact, because often, 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 you can't get the exact composition in frame. I'm not saying crop it to pieces and go all the way small in. So, tweaking it a little bit strengthens the story. So, the easiest thing, and maybe, I, actually, when I'm finished here, I'll try and do a quick video on Lightroom to discuss this in further depth, but short version for me on cropping. This is, the how is easy, yeah? It's the why that makes the difference. So, why would you crop? There's two elements that I keep in mind always and that I teach on workshops, is visual mass and visual energy. 
The visual energy in a frame is, if you look at a scene, does your eye want to go side to side, or does your eyes want to go up and down in the frame? For example, if I shoot a landscape image of a cheetah running after a gazelle, the energy in that frame is going side to side. It's not going up and down. So you would, number one, off the bat, not crop it into a portrait orientation. That would be breaking the visual energy. You want to try and enhance the energy in the frame to make it a support the narrative and help the story that you're trying to tell. So, for example, if it allows for it, take your normal orientation out of camera for that type of scene and pull it into a 16 by 9 which enhances the horizontal aspect in the frame, thereby enhancing your story because it's underlining the visual energy that goes side to side. Yo, that's a lot. I hope you followed all that. Same thing. Let's say, for example, we close up and there's a giraffe standing next to us. I would be tempted immediately to turn into a portrait orientation because me looking at that frame says to my viewer, it's an up and down energy. There's no side to side there. The visual energy goes up and down. So if I'm gonna try and shoot it uh, horizontal or landscape orientation, it's not gonna work. Try and support the visual energy in the scene that you are seeing, side to side, up and down, and choose your orientation there. Once that's in camera, when you then get to your crop, you try and see what you can do, what things can you eliminate to make the story stronger. Don't just crop to get the thing in the middle, that's just stupid. Try and lose little branches on the side by cropping it out. If you've got a giraffe standing on the side and you can crop it a little bit on one side, it's very subtle, but it supports the visual energy. Visual mass is the same thing. Also, no, same thing. It's the same principle. Visual mass is the element in the frame that draws your eye the most. Those elements, that's, and, and, and if you look at all the rules, I hate the rules, but rule of third, the golden mean, and those things, it's where you place things in the frame. And the things in this case is that visual mass, the strongest element the eye of the lion, the head of the tiger, the foot of the polar bear, whatever it is that you're shooting, that's what you want to focus on placing in the frame. Like I said, let me, if I find time after this, it's Friday now, I'll do another quick video on Lightroom where we can just run through some examples. But the basic of why you want to crop is think, where's the visual energy in this frame going? Side to side, up and down, and then tweak accordingly to enhance the feeling of that visual energy. It does sound a bit shy and out there, but I guarantee you that it works. Daniel, thank you for the email. It's something that a lot of people ask on safaris and workshops is, it's great being out in the Mara and Madikwe and shooting wild dogs and lions and crossings and all these things, but what if I go home? What do I do then? How do I keep the inspiration, the photographic voice, everything? How do I keep those things going? The, the easiest, and no, okay, I know what some people will say. No, it's cool, have you got dogs? Yes, you have dogs, so why don't you go photograph them in your garden? Because I don't want to. For me, I photograph wildlife. I find it very difficult to transfer that, that same passion and excitement for me into photographing my dogs. I love my dogs, but I don't want to pan them up and down the garden. If that's something that you want to do, it can most definitely work. I think if you want to grow as a wildlife photographer, get out into the field as much as possible. Yes, I know there's financial implications and I know we all have to work, unfortunately. So, do a combination of, for example, Find blogs that inspire you, find videos that inspire you. Because as long as you keep this photographic mind busy and thinking about composition and the narrative, I hate the, the, the whole storytelling. Everybody's now suddenly saying, people who have never taught before online is now starting to say, you must tell stories, you must tell stories. It's boring, it's, it's okay, I'm gonna go off on a rant here, but I'm gonna block it for myself. Cancel. You need to try and look at the narrative in your frames and how you are telling or how you're translating the scene that you saw to people. The more you look at images, the more you read about photography, the more videos you watch, watch documentaries, learn animal behavior at home. Look at like, for example, there's that DVD series called Africa. Beautiful behavior, beautiful discussion, beautiful ideas visually will stimulate you that when you get into the field, you're ready. That's the artistic and the creative approach. Technically, learn your camera. I mean, if that means panning your dogs, you know what, if you have to do it, do it. Or, depending where you're at, Go to a local pond where there's geese flying around. Go to the Pilansburg if you're in Johannesburg, which is two hours away. There's many things like that which you could, which you could try. It, and then save up and go on a trip. I guarantee you, you will learn more on a photographic safari with us 
over four, five days, or 10 days, depending on what you go on, then you will, for two months on your own, photographing your dogs. So do what you can, I know it's difficult, do what you can at home. If you need to have your wife run up and down the garden and pan her, do it. But keep the visual, keep, the, keep this photographic voice busy. It's so important that you eventually, when you get to the field then, you've got these ideas. You've seen this on Africa, you've seen this on Jerry's blog, you've seen this on my Instagram feed, whatever. Use the content and the, and the digital world we live in to keep the photographic voice busy. People worry too much about the technical. The technical you'll get, the first half an hour on the first trip, you'll get back into it. But I think people's images are boring and flat because they worry too much about the tech and they don't spend enough time feeding that photographic voice. So if I give you anything, Daniel, focus on that. Watch as many videos as you can, watch images, look for people who inspire you and then do the little bit of tech leading up to a trip. That's a bit all over the place. But go with that. Feed the photographic voice, feed the, cre the, the creative side in here that when you get to the field, you can see the moments. Capturing them technically, that's the easy part. Wow, that's a tough one. I've got, a, I've got this thing where, cancel this. A while ago, I spoke to someone who went on a self drive trip to the Kruger, and they had, I kid you not, four cameras, each with its own focal length. So you could have something, for example, like, 14, 24, 24, 70, 70, 200, 200, 400. Yeah, that covers a wide range. Nice to have, and make no mistake, all of us have a little bit of a gear haul in us where we want to have all that stuff. However, I try to, when I photograph, I try to have one camera, I always have two, but I try and focus on one because the moment it's time to get that shot and the action starts happening, you don't want to be sitting making additional decisions. You don't want to have to make the decision of, Wow, this lion's about to jump. Do I use my 14-24 and get a super wide angle? Do I get a 24-70 and get close to the action and get ghost subjects in? Do I go 70-200 and just isolate him? Or do I go 200-400 and get the lion's eye? Yeah? You don't have to make the decisions because you already have so many tech decisions to make when it's time to take the shot. Where to focus, how to focus, do I overexpose, do I underexpose? What aperture to use? Is my ISO correct? All of these things happen anyway. I would minimize your... your, your your technical choices as far as possible in order to make getting the shot easier. So, you mentioned you've got a 105. If you don't do macro, get rid of it. Then you say you have a 7200 and a 1424. Now, 1424 is an amazing lens and I always have it in my bag. I very, very seldomly actually take it out because for wildlife, depending on where you're shooting, it is not so common to get subjects that close that you could effectively use the 1424. Most of the time, subjects are a little bit further away, which at a 20, uh, which at a 1424 focal length renders them this big, very small, this big, comma, very small in your frame. The 200, 500, absolutely, that will be your focus, your, your big focal length. You can pick that up, zoom all the way in, zoom all the way out, depending where you, did you say where you were going to? Uh, um, Kalahari, take the big lens. 200, 500 will be your main lens. I would always be very hesitant to get rid of my 7200 wherever I go, whether I'm going Madikwe, Sabi, Mara, Amboseli, Monopools, or Svalbard to do polar, polar bears, I will always pack that lens first. Depending if you're a little bit further away, the 7200 gives me beautiful range to create telephoto type landscape shots, if that makes sense. And also then if I'm closer, it's very versatile. So think about this, if you take a 200-500 like you want to get, Plus your 7200, you are covering the focal lengths from 70 to 500, big range. And the 70 to 200 range is golden, you cannot discount that. If you have 200 to 500, and then you miss this whole intimate close area here, depending how close you are to the animal, and then 1424, you're probably going to end up just using your 200 500. I would, in your perfect world, Alyssa, I would go 1424 in the bag for stars, and if something does come very, very, very close, then I would use my two go-tos would be 7200 and 2500. It just makes sense to me from a wildlife photography point of view. If you're going out to do landscapes or such, it changes. But for Kalahari wildlife, 7200 and 200 to 500. That just seems comfortable and practical. Right guys, that's it. That's episode 21, wrapped. Lots of talking there. Hope there's something in you that speaks to you. 
If you guys have any questions, send them through. Details at the end of this video. Like I said, I'm in the office for most of November. Small trips coming up in December. What we'll more on that later on? And so yeah, so check the blog, check the video content, Instagram still golden, amazing stuff happening there. I will see you there again. Here's the link. Go and follow me over there. It's amazing. It's Friday. You guys have a fantastic weekend, and you keep sending the questions. I will keep on answering them for you. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I will see you guys next time.